Aloha, everybody. Welcome back to the Think Tech Hawaii studios for another episode of Security Matters. Today, we're going to get into something that I know you're all thinking about when you go outside. <laughs> How can I stop touching stuff? So William Plant is going to join us today. And um, this got my attention because he's got a, a paper uh, that he put out on his uh, forum. I forget the name, but we'll get into that, William, in a little bit. And then, um, but frictionless access control. Um, everybody's been getting asked about it. There's, there's things you can do, but he had a cool slant on it going back to get smart. So we're, we're going to get into some of this stuff today. Um, William, thanks so much for joining me. I know you're a busy guy. No, thank you very much for the opportunity. It's a topic I, I love to talk about. So appreciate the chance. Cool. So a lot of our audience, I mean, I've seen you on many stages, but a lot of our audience may not uh, know your history. So would you mind giving, uh, just share a little bit of your background, how you, um, sort of got into the industry and, uh, worked your way to where you're at today? Thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'm a Canadian. So right off the bat, I say schedule and about and project and God save the queen. Uh, and so <laughs> I, I, people can pick that off me pretty quickly. Uh, so just by, by way of background, uh, I Canadian military for a bit, uh, went back to school and uh, was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life and my career. And I was working for the hotel industry security and going to school. And I had a very good uh, mentor, you know, kind of a mentor light. He said, you're really good at the security stuff. You should consider it a career, right? And I was going into computer sciences. And so the short story is that all of my, my first half of my career was in Canada, working corporations, hotels, credit card manufacturing, places like that. But I said to myself, I wanted to have my own business before I was 40. And my wife and I decided to start a business in Phoenix we created a security consulting firm, very boutique. And our largest client, uh, when we really got launched, was Symantec. And so we did a lot of their support for about three and a half, four years. And after 9-11, uh, our contract manager said, we want to make a, a department out of you, uh, rather than just you know, paying you for what we are. And we went, oh, OK, right? And so I got into Symantec, was the first security person there on the physical side and uh, moved back into IT operations. IT is, is a topic I love. So I worked with uh, Intuit for about four and a half years. And the day that I handed in my resignation to join uh, Aronson Security Group, a company you know very well in Seattle, they said, William, we wanted to give you a promotion. And I said, no, I'm here to quit. Uh, <laughs> and so I had a choice to make and uh, I, I made that choice. And so um, it's been uh, almost 10 years uh, between Aronson Security, a company that I cherish quite a bit, um, and now with, with ADT, uh, doing the same kind of work uh, with, with Ed Baco. So short story, that, that's where I've come from, what I do. Amazing. And you're, um, is it, you guys have a team, you're like a, you're like a senior researcher, consultant. Um, you guys are running a team for ADT Commercial now. Is that um, focused on the enterprise space, or I'm not too sure what the... Your yeah, uh, so the short story is that yeah, that's correct. Uh, so I'm a senior principal consultant. And, and really what that just simply means is that I've got a pretty good uh, length of time uh, in the saddle. Uh, I do have gray hair. It's right in here. Uh, <laughs> I got a little bit of that. <laughs> yeah, a little bit too. Yeah, I have to tell people I'm actually in my 60s now. Uh, but, but the point is that uh, so I'm a senior. And, and we have a team of nine people in total. And so what we do with uh, corporations that we work for, primarily enterprise, maybe some large regionals, uh, is that they will t they have some kind of a problem that they're looking for an external opinion or assistance on, like many uh, program or strategy or technical consultants. So we kind of do all of that. My speciality and my passion is, is around technology and, and that's my juice. Uh, and, uh, and so that's what we do. And uh, we're primarily, uh, the team is based in Seattle with the exception of all the principals. So I have two principals that I work with. Uh, one in Virginia City, uh, former 30 year uh, FBI law enforcement agent, and then a fellow who just came out of the uh, hospital sector. Again, several decades, former police officer, and his whole shtick is, is in, hos in hospital. So yeah, that's, that's the team. And we have a we have a lot of fun doing what we do. That's that's sincerely the truth. Yeah, is the is do you find the enterprise space is is just a little more open to sort of longer term development, a little bit larger budget? That when they when they have a need, they're willing to kind of let you 
go through the real motions of, of solving it. That's got to be fun. There's not many people to get to work on that edge of the industry. You, you know what? The answer is yes, you, you are quite correct. Uh, and that's a double-edged sword, right? So that on the <laughs> one hand, uh, and as, as an example, I was working with a, a Boston-based technology firm, and he said, look at just because we got a lot of money, right? Because on the surfaces, they, they spend a lot of money on technology. They're globally uh, dispersed. And so they've made it really clear. So this guy made it very, very clear. Yes, I am going to spend a lot of money, but I'm going to spend it very well. You're going to earn every nickel. Uh, and he was <laughs> not joking. Uh, and so the enterprise space, and you probably know this, right? Is it's uh, 4.30 on a Friday afternoon. You get a call. Hey, William, guess what? And, and they've got a problem. And, and you cannot say, you call me Monday. That's not yeah. the business that we're in. Right. Uh, so that, that's true. So they can spend money sometimes, but they can spend it very wisely. And I've not yet met an uneducated client. Everybody knows what they're, at that level, everybody knows what they're doing and what they're talking about. And so you cannot BS them. Right? You've got to be yeah. very clear, transparent, honest, declare your biases. But, uh, but establishing that strategic partnership with, with those clients, you're right. It's very rewarding because you can stand back and point at something and go, we did that together and it really mattered. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, the, I remember some of the clients that you brought in with Aronson up at the great conversation in Seattle and some of the success stories you guys had had and they, the approach to making them successful in their business was that thing that was missing a lot. You know, there was a lot of people out there trying to sell security, but, but how are you enhancing the business? And that approach was quite... Uh, I think refreshing, you know, at the great conversations where I first got started, I heard that sort of approach. And maybe that was some of Phil and some of Aronson's sort of approach to business as well. That, yeah, you, you are quite correct. When, um, true story, I was dubious about joining Aronson. So when I was getting ready to leave into it, I was going to go back into consulting. And uh, so I, I was introduced to him and he, you know, if you will, pitched ASG to me. And he convinced me, but I said, I'm going to give you six months, right? Let's, let's agree. We're dating. We're not married yet. Uh, and so I'm going to give it a shot. And the first time I had a project where I said, we can't actually sell this, this company, our services and, and equipment. This really is going to be a pure up consulting. And we're going to have to point them to a different direction that we would normally service. But that's what they need. He said, that was the deal. And Phil Aronson stood by that. So I have a lot of respect for Phil because he said this is what he would do. And when the first opportunity came, that's what he did. And, and that's why I stayed. I could allow awesome. it, but I didn't. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's a lot of people in the industry that could have benefited from a six-month date with Phil Aronson, I was sure. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't, I've yet to get him on this show, but I will eventually. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's pretty good. So let's, let's – so the, the genesis of this paper with the whole Get Smart thing, I had not – even thought of that. I saw that as a kid. I mean, I'm 57 myself. So I, I saw that, but I never put that back together. So did mm -hmm. that, did that, did you see it and it struck you to write the paper? Did it, or did you just re were looking for something to reflect upon? Cause that, that was frictionless for him. You know I mean? Other than picking up the phone in the booth, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah that's, that's a good question, uh, Andrew. So, uh, First of all, I enjoy writing. It's, it's one of the things that I do recreationally, actually. Uh, and when I'm paid to do it, that's just you know, even better. <laughs> so I was in a conversation with one of my colleagues uh, on the national account uh, side, and we were having a conversation for, about one of his clients who wanted this, you know, what's frictional security? I've heard about mm -hmm. it. The idea has been around what, quite a long time, actually, uh, in terms of the professional trade magazines. And so I was speaking to him, well, my interpretation of frictional security is these kinds of experiences. And, and that's how I look at it. And, and so we had that conversation. And then secondly, I, I was working with a Seattle-based uh, technology company. And during the uh, preliminary schematic design phase, they were, they were telling us, we want frictionless security. Well, what do you mean by that, right? So I've got these two kind of discussions that were going on. Now, quite uh, coincidentally, if you remember, uh, Don Adams was was Agent uh, 86, uh, but there was a, there'd been a new snippet about Barbara Felden, right? Agent okay. 99. Yeah. And I remembered the scene, the opening scene <laughs> with uh, Agent 86 walking through this, this series of four doors to the, to the telephone booth. And I made the connection. 
that's the first time I remember, right, uh, that somebody had this frictionless security experience, formidable doors, but he walks through completely unencumbered. And that led me to research, well, how did he even come up with that? And that was the genesis of the paper. Mm. Yeah, and there were multiple doors. I remember Star Trek, they would walk through the door and it would open and close. And uh, yep. they, they had the anti-pass back problem a lot. People would be coming and going in both directions in that show. It was always a busy scene, it seems like. Um, yes. So um, to the reality of the situation of, of frictionless. Now, I know you uh, just recently had to travel and, and not many folks have had to travel yet. So what was your experience uh, going through the airports? What, uh, what was on your mind about did frictionless occur? I guess since you wrote the paper, it must have been on your mind. <laughs> Yeah, regrettably, uh, it was not a frictionless experience, but that's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, yeah, so for the audience, uh, I my first travel post, uh, or I guess uh, during the COVID, uh, was to a client uh, in Dallas, Fort Worth. And so I booked on an, an airline and it, it took, actually, by the way, it took the president of the company to approve it. I mean, that's how wow. sensitive to, yeah. to travel yeah. we are, right? but there was a good just, uh, business justification for it. So when I got to my airport, no problems. It was, it was pretty straightforward. I live in Western North Carolina. It's easy to get in and out, not a problem. The, the experience that I had though, in terms of friction, there was a lot of friction trying to come back mm. because the bus dropped me off at the correct terminal, but the door set that we went into, and a bunch of us went in, that whole section of the terminal was shut down. Mm. So we didn't know that. What we're looking at is how come Americans shut down, right? And then we saw people pointing this way. And then we, we got there. There's fairly large crowds. And if you know what the check-in experience is like, well, I had to check a bag. And it says, okay, you, you've got to get the luggage tag first. But there's no way to know well, where do I go to do that because there's no signage. And mm. one person that there is available is swamped with people asking the same question not a frictionless experience. And so uh, I, I talked to somebody going, God, what they should do, right? Because we can all make those recommendations is people should know, don't drop people off at that door because they're going to be confused. And oh, by the way, put up signs that say, if you don't need a luggage tag, go here. If you do, go here. And everything would have then been informed and you would know what you're doing, which reduces you know, the anxiety and a little bit of frustration. Sure. Interesting. Okay, we're going to jump real quick to a commercial we got to pay some bills we'll take 60 seconds and we will be right back with william plant Hey, aloha, and welcome back to Security Matters. We're talking with William Plant today, and we're chopping up frictionless security. Uh, it, it is available, by the way. It comes with a little bit of a price. So, William, let's, let's, let's get into some of the technology that's available. My experience was in really just around healthcare. You've seen around the ERs where they've got to move gurneys. They can wave their hand and that'll, you know, in front of the paddle, and that'll open the door. And I've also seen it on intercom, specifically in healthcare environments where they need to speak to an ER. They don't want anybody to come and go. So I've seen a little bit of that, but I know there's devices now you can sort of add to almost any opener and you wave a hand and get in that kind of stuff. Um, what, where's, where's this technology going? You know, what's, uh, what's really viable today in your opinion? Yeah, that's a, a really good question, Andrew. Um, so first of all, there's things that are, are very, very doable today. Right, uh, and a lot of it come. I think there's probably two, maybe three different criteria to apply. And, and going back to your example in the hospital, right? If a person's <clears throat> pushing a gurney, uh, 
those doors are closed. <clears throat> Very similar to what you saw with, with Agent 86. Yeah. The, uh, the sensor senses the proximity of an approaching, in this case, a, a gurney. And it doesn't need to know that it's a person, gurney, or anything. It just needs to know it's going to open the door so the operator operates, right? There's no identity involved in, in that. Yeah. Whereas Point. the second example you just used, identity is involved because in order for them to get past that barrier, that control point, they're going to have some kind of an interaction. Not only do you, in that case, maybe you have to have the right, you have to be the right person, but the reason you need to get in might have to be validated, right? Uh, now, we don't get quite that far on the enterprise side, but to answer your, your, your question specifically, uh, today it's very easy if you are designing a campus, especially right off the bat, if, you, if the use case you say is, I want my employee, Andrew Laning, to park his car, come through to his workspace and enter and only be stopped if he's not supposed to be there, right? Okay. Then you can design to that, right? You can say, well, do you want a, a, a smart car with some kind of a proximity reader? And there's a whole you know, use case for that. Or do you want to use a Bluetooth enabled smartphone and manage your credentials and do all that? And as an aside, by the way, two companies that I've worked with, they said, yeah, 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 we want that. Not because it was functionally better, it just looked cool. And they were <laughs> using that to support their brand. They wanted their clients to understand, we are cutting edge, we're cool, and we're gonna do that. Uh, now on the flip side, um, we, you, the article talked about a Salesforce. If you come into the Salesforce main lobby, right? Mm -hmm. the, visually, there is this experience of these huge, um, video walls and cascading water and a little bit of sound. And that just sucks your vision up off of the barrier. But as you're walking through the barrier, if you're supposed to be there, right? Doors pop open, you go through like it's nothing there. So all these things are easy to do today. What's prompting some fascinating discussions in the industry is around what does COVID-19 do to all of this? Mm. Because now people are very sensitive to, to touching space or things that other people touch and how do you mitigate that and yes it is possible to create not just a frictionless but a touchless experience if you're designing a new campus well easy right because you can plan for it if you have to retrofit it you got to be a lot more thoughtful uh, and i think that there are things coming at the application side like applications on your smartphone where you can do a lot of things uh, through an artificial intelligence integration that will just blow your mind away. I mean, it's, it's, I hope it's going to be very cool. Yeah. I, um, do you think that we're, I know we've been leveraging the cloud more and more and more for a lot of these different applications, right? And so if we've, if we're sending multi, multi applications that are, you know, authenticating us and proving who we are and proving we have the phone with us and we're in the right location, maybe all that data is getting sent up and processed and it's the right time of day. So the door opens for me. Um, what do you think our, our risk is if, uh, you know, we get DDoSed, right? And then all of a sudden, nobody can go anywhere because all the, the applications are locked up or ransomed or something in the cloud. You know, that's, a, that's the one sort of concern I have about cloud. Um, you know, the border gateway problem, border gateway protocol still is a bit of a problem. Um, and, sure. and dynamic denial of service is, is a bit of a problem. So, you know, sure. DDoS, I think we can scale around a little bit, but there's still yep. some other issues there. And if you had a whole campus full of people that suddenly couldn't move, <laughs> you got to default back to the, where's my card and where's the reader and mm -hmm. all that. Yeah, that's a, a legitimate concern that happens, right? We, be, we, on the security industry and device side, we've been both the attack uh, object mm -hmm. and we've been the platform by which attacks have been launched, right? That, that's happened. And yeah. so it's, it's a legitimate concern. Again, if, um, if, if you're starting on a greenfield project, you can say, let's use a working assumption that <clears throat> our infrastructure is going to be either uh, completely uh, debilitated through an attack or, or maybe some kind of, of a data center failure uh, or partially, right? A reduced uh, uh, inhibited yeah. type of service. So let's then plan some resiliency around that. And so going back to my earlier experience, uh, if all of a sudden I have to, be, I have to use my card uh, in order to read it and push something because the operator's not working. Uh, okay, right, as long as I understand that in a degrade mode, that's what my experience is going to be. Mm -hmm. If you don't plan for it, it's going to happen to you, and then you're going to be one of those people that have got to answer the phone from the CEO's office, how come I can't get in? Those have happened. 
you don't want to be the person doing that. So just use that as a working assumption. In, in my case, we work with IT groups a lot and say, how do we make sure that assuming the threat model occurs, a DDoS attack or some other kind of debilitating attack, we need to make sure that these basic functionalities still occur in a degraded mode. And systems, the more advanced systems especially, are engineered or should be engineered to be able to provide that. But that's, that's yeah. a good question because it does happen. Yeah, I've seen the, the most uh, frustrating thing that I've seen is in the, you know, the new uh, destination dispatch systems. And so when those are, when those, when they're having trouble, I don't know if they're servicing them, but all of a sudden they'll go into a degraded mode. And I mean, you can't get one. <laughs> I've been in these buildings and you're just waiting and waiting and waiting. It's like, and it, there's no feedback, right? Because it doesn't, they didn't set up a display that says this elevator is in degraded mode, go down three floors to catch it or something. Uh, I've, I've noticed that. And that's a, just a failure of um, feed, feedback to the user. You can imagine in a security scenario where you're standing there in front of the door and it just doesn't open and you're just standing there like, what do I do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's you hit the, one of the common complaints around enterprise system design, especially when it goes into degraded failure, is communications in terms of, I don't understand why I can't do something. And, and this happens periodically. Uh, security operators in a control center, you know, uh, doing a sysadmin job, suddenly realize we're dropping cameras like crazy, right? And, and if they're, especially if they are on, on sharing a corporate network, which is not advisable, by the way, separate issue, uh, <laughs> then they become very quickly aware, oh my gosh, our network is going into degradation. Mm -hmm. And that might be a critical camera, might not be, but sometimes they are. And it you know, I have seen conversations from that operations center to a network operations center going, hey, why are our cameras falling apart, right? Like we're, we're losing connectivity. What, 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 who, what? And, and so they, they, you know, they, the network operations center learn of network failure because somebody called and said, my cameras aren't working. Uh -huh. Yeah. And so communications, the number one complaint when systems go into partial or full degradation is I don't know what's going on. Yeah. So do you, do you think we'll be able to leverage um, a little more, you know, like, like voice, um, some, some of the other biometrics, having a sort of a multi, multiple biometric, you know, we've got, we've got iris at a distance, we've got face at a distance, I can talk. So, you know, if I'm not quite sure my, my um, what are they, my assurance levels are only running 85 today because maybe you got hit with a softball over the weekend and your eyes swollen up or whatever it may be. You know, do you think um, or do you see uh, sort of like the AI and the, the ML engines being able to help us use multiple biometrics to really have a, 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 a high, high level of confidence that you're who you're supposed to be and, and it's okay to leave my door open for you? Yes, uh, that's a really good example, actually. Uh, there are there's fascinating development work being done on the AI side, especially on biometrics. Uh, as you're probably aware, right? There's there's one that's using 3D mapping of the face to, to answer the very problem of, I got a shiner from a baseball game yeah. this weekend, right? And so I got to deal with that, but 3D visual mapping of your facial biometrics, and then your experience is you're just walking in, and not only am I walking in, but maybe you and Christine and somebody else, we're all together walking as a group, we can come through and the system's catching all of us, and they're saying those are all permitted and, and let, allow you to pass. If it were me, and I'm and I'm saying I, I'm doing that because of the uh, the convenience and the experience, but I would also then have an ace in my back pocket to say, but if that fails, okay, right. So just to be safe, maybe I want a touchless biometric, like like the hand wave. There's, as you know, uh, devices that will scan your handprint and your, your thumb fingerprints, and you don't even have to touch it, right? It used to be the this, and that yeah. was that or that, and now it's this. And, and in you go with the same kind of assurances that you are who you are, because it is biometric, than say 10 years ago when you had to press and wait and figure sure. your, your, your finger out a little bit to get, uh, you know, get red. I'm waiting on the, the flow beat. It'll just kind of take your hair follicles and just analyze your DNA, because that's probably really, really good. I think there are maybe are some twins that share so much DNA, they'd be hard to tell apart. But uh, I don't, I don't yeah, know how far... Yeah, I don't know how far it'll have to go to, to uh, you know, to get really, truly frictionless. But the point uh, that you're making says it's available today. Um, do you think, uh, how much is the cost of consideration? Is this truly better done as a greenfield 
than a retrofit, um, you know, in your experience? I mean, I'm sure the number of portals and things like that make a difference. The amount of throughput, you know, if you got to get 10,000 people in a building, it's different. But um, yeah, there, first of all, these are not cheap by virtue of the fact that there's still a lot of development uh, yeah. for some of these things. And so companies have put some very substantial research and development dollars into this stuff. And, you know, they're, they're going to sell it all out in one day, of course, but these will come at a slight premium. Uh, that's going to be the first thing. I think, uh, secondly of all, if it's a green field, if you're starting with just a campus and that's the investment you want to make, I think the important thing is to, in my business, what I would do is I say, okay, if conceptually we want to propagate this or deploy it across the entire enterprise in some way, shape or form, okay, that's, that needs to be done in a staged way. And so not only do you have to think about how to bring in that new technology and, and use it at a given campus, but what's the plan to propagate it out? And that's mm. where you run into problems, right? Because a, a region or a general manager can say, that's great, Andrew, if you're paying for it, then I'm fine, right? Uh, yeah. But if I gotta pay for it, you better give me some discretion. So it becomes you know, a little caught up in the weeds. But what I would also say is that if you have the right application, you are a corporate campus, you're a corporate headquarters, you know, like Apple spent a you know, billion dollars on the business, Salesforce with that magnificent entrance way. Uh, it does make a statement about you, who you are. It contributes to your brand. And certainly if, if clients have got choices to make and one of the things they're thinking about is, is the brand that they're gonna be buying into, yeah, you should have a brand that's reflective in your capabilities, you know, back to what you're doing, even at that, the visitor and, and the security level. It, it does kind of matter. Yeah, it makes sense. The, the reflection on brand is super critical. Well, we've got a minute or so left. Um, what's your what's your advice for the, uh, I guess, the enterprise manager who's who's interested or the the company that's struggling with how to how to reopen and, you know, could frictionless be a, a part of what they do to make their, their themselves or their guests safer? Um, final thoughts there. Yeah. Uh, first of all, for, for something like that, don't go it alone, right? <laughs> uh, you do certainly want to bring in some of your key stakeholders, HR, legal, uh, and IT especially, and say, we may want to get to this experience at some point because there's all kinds of implications in the workplace for post-COVID-19 recovery. I mean, there's a lot of them. Secondly, uh, there's all kinds of webinars and forums that discuss this kind of thing. See what other people are doing. Others have already made mistakes that people, other people are learning from. I'm a big believer in let someone else make the mistake you can learn from. Uh, and then thirdly, if you're going to make a, a large investment, do a little bit of, of test and try, right? You don't have to buy 600 new uh, elevated skin temperature <laughs> cameras and then go, oh, we made a mistake, right? Buy a couple, try them out, make sure they're going to work for your environment, and then, then you, you can make a commitment. Just be very methodical and thoughtful. Have a wide view and bring the focus narrow. Yeah, that's great advice. The lab experiences can save you a fortune. You know, you absolutely need to test these solutions out. William, I really appreciate you spending time with us today. Um, you want to plug your uh, group for us real quick, your LinkedIn group? Oh, sure. Uh, so I started a group, I, and uh, one of the uh, original members is, is Andrew, and it's the uh, Physical Security Digital Transformation Forum. And it was just a place for people in the security technology space who think about how to make things better with technology, have a place for a voice, share experiences, do peer reviews. And, uh, you know, we're small, but this is a very vocal group, and it's been great. Yeah, the comments are excellent. Well, thank you so much again. I appreciate you spending time with us today. We will talk again soon, sir. I'll chat online, one Aloha. of the two. Aloha. Yeah, regards, Christine.